to our afternoon session. I am Kathy Littles. I am the Dean of the School of Consciousness and Transformation here at CIS, and I'm honored to provide an introduction for the panel Global Utopian Social Movements, 1968 to 2018, where our panel moderator will be Professor Jennifer Wells. So a little bit about this panel. Um, welcome. The panel's three talks talk, touch on the paradoxes of the necessities and the contradictions of utopic thought in the face of struggles against social and ecological oppressions and harms. The capacity of the realistically utopic imagination was a key to many global movements of 1968. It is indeed more than ever today important to learn from past social movements and to advance social change today. The global angle matters because, as Doris Katsapikas has argued, solidarities between diverse groups, from the local to the global, is crucial to the success of social movements, however fleeting or enduring. So it is my honor to introduce three panelists. Our first panelist will be Eddie Yuen, who will speak on the uses of memory versus nostalgia by the social movements of the 1968 era. Mr. Walter Turner will speak on African nationalism, pan-Africanism in Africa, the global impacts of the 1968 era social movements. And finally, Jennifer Wells will talk about utopic thought, the anthro Anthropocene, political ecology in 1968 and today. A brief bio for each of our speakers. Mr. Walter Turner is a leading authority and commenter on contemporary African affairs, a radio host, and a college professor. Turner is the founder, host, and producer of the weekly Pacifica radio program, Africa Today on contemporary Africa and the African diaspora, one of the most popular programs on KPFA radio. His commentaries have appeared in The Black Scholar and on Pacifica National News, National Public Radio, and PBS. Professor Turner was a founder and director of the Africa Resource Center that was located in Oakland, California. He was one of the authors of the book no Easy Victories, African Liberation in the African and American Activists Over Half a Century, 1950 to 2000, published by Africa World Press in 2007. He's also an author in a recent compilation on the life of Ami Claire Cabral, titled Claim No Easy Victories, the Legacy, the Legacy of Ami Claire Cabral, through um, uh, published, excuse me, in 2013. Turner has traveled extensively for decades throughout the African uh, continent and the African diaspora. Professor Turner was a delegation leader to both the World Social Forum in Nairobi, Kenya in 2007 and the World Social Forum in Dakar, Senegal in 2011. He has assisted human rights projects around the world, working closely with political prisoners and sustainable community development. Welcome, Mr. Turner. Professor Wells is an author and a faculty here at CIS in the Transformative, Transformative Studies Department. Her specialties are Transition and Utopia Studies and anthrop Anthropocene. She has developed ways to apply lenses like complex thought, social justice, and environmental humanities to systemic change in the face of global warming and other crises, which is a topic of her book, Complexity and Sustainability, published in 2014. She wrote a previous book on the social and ecological impacts of biotechnologies, a dozen journal articles, and about a hundred other articles and essays for the popular press. She is one of a group of co-founders of the San Francisco branch of 350.org and serves on the 350 Bay Area Public Speakers Bureau giving talks on climate crisis, 
and on the systemic and integral approaches to global transition today. And finally, Eddie Nguyen is a writer, editor, and radio producer. His most recent work is a piece on the discourse of environmental collapse in the book Catastrophism, excuse me, and the Apocalyptic, can you pronounce it for me? Apocalyptic, excuse me, I didn't have my coffee this morning. Politics of Collapse and Rebirth, published in 2012. He is the chief editor of Confronting Capitalism, Dispatches from a Global Movement, published in 2003, and The Battle of Seattle, The New Challenge to Capitalist Globalization, published in 2002, both on Soft Skull Press. Yuen is a contributing producer of the radio program Against the Grain and is currently researching the political economy and cultural significance of extinction. Please give a hand to our three guests. Thank you so much, Dean Little, and we'll start right off the bat with our speaker, Eddie Yuen. Thank you. Um, well, fine. Uh, so I am. Um, Thank you. Um, I assembled some slides for today from an archive that my father created, which is now at UC Berkeley. It's there at the bottom line, the HK Ewan <laughs> archive. And if you Google that uh, HK Ewan collection, you'll find some resources. Um, I won't say too much about it. He was a, 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 a scientist, actually a scholar from China, who came to uh, the United States in the 50s and was uh, blown away by the social movements and started documenting them with all forms of media, including uh, mainly audio, but also uh, photography and collecting the flyers and materials. So I spent a lot of time as a person who did not experience the 1960s, you know, uh, but immersed in the, the primary sources of the, of the era, and of course, uh, growing up in Berkeley in the Bay Area, feeling the legacy and weight of this era, right? Of, of what happened, um, but from a generation that uh, did not experience it. So, um, so I have some reflections on this. Every five years um, or so, there's some kind of 1960s commemoration, and I've been to many of them. Uh, and some events are commemorated more than others, right? So some of these slides here that my father took in 1966, the anti-war movement, you see Berkeley. Um, this is kind of what I think a lot of people think of when you think of like, the 60s, it's sort of these predominantly white college students uh, at especially Berkeley, but some other campuses uh, in the United States, uh, with the primary issue being um, anti-war. Uh, I would maybe loosely go with these, with these, with these slides, but um, this is kind of an image that you, know, you, might, you might see. Uh, but I wanted to, um, to say that one of the things that we, we don't, I think that's always struck me, is that we tend to commemorate um, certain events, I mean, 1968 in general, the free speech movement. Uh, in the Bay Area, we commemorate the Third World Strikes at SF State this year, and UC Berkeley next year, 69. These are very important movements, uh, all of them. Uh, but it's also the case that there are some things that we don't um, remember as well. There are things that are not as well known. And also, I've always been struck by the way in which uh, the movements since the 60s, um, and I would say, when I say the 60s or 68, I'm really thinking of a long 60s, or the sense of Frederick Jameson, you know, starting with some anti-colonial era, maybe Dien Bien Phu, you know, and ending, you know, I don't know, the criminology school battle at Berkeley, it's unclear, but whatever the case is, uh, it's not a, a thing, a specific year or date, but whatever it is, it did end at some point, and the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, 20, and the current century, uh, we've had massive movements as well, but these movements tend not to be as memorialized, not as commemorated, uh, and that to me is sort of a question, and I think I'm going to leave it as an open question and maybe we can, you know, go into it toward discussion. Um, so that's sort of what's hanging over, and I have some, you know, ideas around what are the different uh, narratives, uh, discourse of the 60s, that may serve to sort of always compare whatever happens currently to that era, um, which has the effect, intentional or not, I think of often diminishing in the present. You know, so for example, when I teach social movements to students, I find that they won't remember a movement that happened, say, 10 years ago. They'll remember May 68, you know, but they won't remember, say, the first Gulf War protest, 1991, which was, you know, 
shut down the whole city, San Francisco, hundreds of thousands of people, etc. You know, the mm -hmm. anti-nuclear movement, uh, 1980, uh, you know, I think was some of the largest crowds ever in the United States, arguably mm -hmm. successful, you know, um, in terms of the peace movement. The Central America and South African solidarity movements, which are, I think, quite successful, uh, are often forgotten. Um, I could go on, even the globalization in Seattle, that movement, uh, 1999, so this is sort of the question I want to sort of leave open. Why, why some things and not others? And, and so the other sort of piece of what, you know, that I think is, is relevant is, is the, the intersection of movements. And I think it's very uh, emphasized currently and in a very positive way, I think, that you know, movements need to be intersectional, right? It's a term that's in, in, in great use. But I think it's important to understand that from going through the primary documents, again, not having the present, there was a way in which the movements of this period, of the 1960s, were, uh, were generative of each other and were always in a kind of a dialogue. And I think that's, that's important because I think, I think sometimes this drops out of specific ways in which they were uh, related to each other, I think is one of the questions uh, that we have to ask. Uh, and again, it's a question of memory. Um, what narratives of, of what happened you know, become uh, our uh, more... Um, or, or I almost could say, which narratives of each generation become uh, the one which, which find favor and are more well known. This is some, uh, I thought this is interesting from the archive. This is 1966, uh, John Hewlett from Lowndes County, Alabama, uh, freedom organization, and this was the Black Panther Party. So the idea of you know, the Black Panther Party being associated with Oakland, but of course, you know, the, there he is uh, speaking at the Spall Plaza. The, I think these photos haven't been seen by anybody since they were shot over 50 years ago. Um, you know, th this is an idea uh, that was in the air at the time, right? It was an idea that was that was circulating, uh, and you can see these flyers are distributed at the Greek Theater, 1966 Black Power Conference, with uh, many, you know, very luminary uh, people. Uh, what's interesting about the, this, not just the image and the name of the, of the Black Panther, but also the politics. The politics were already very internationalist. I think Walter will speak to this. And also, of course, very directly opposed to the Vietnam War. So I think this narrative, again, of sort of two major strands of the um, 60s being the sort of the, the anti-war movement uh, embodied by you know, white college students protesting the draft, and then the black civil rights movement, uh, I, I, you know, it seems to me that, that from the very start that these were, these were uh, in dialogue, and in fact, you know, there was a way in which the, uh, the African American and later, uh, I think, Chicano, Latino, and Native American soldiers and GIs really pushed the movement. Uh, and I would say the same thing, I would say this about a lot of the movements. We talked about labor in the earlier session. Uh, labor, uh, I think there's a surprising evidence of, of interface with movements that's, that's left out. Um, all of the sort of so called ethnic identity movements, which originate in this period, um, have a, a reference to anti war, uh, the Vietnam struggle. Uh, and also um, feminism. Uh, and, and you have to hold the microphone next to you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay. So here is. I thought this was interesting because uh, we think of anti-fascism as something that's very much in the news these days. This is 1966 anti-fascist rally, uh, in which the um, not just the Klan but the parts of the Hell's Angels. So we're thinking about the, the, the problematic of counterculture, right? In Hunter S. Thompson, there was always a sort of dark side within um, some aspects of white counterculture. And there you can see an aspect of it right there. Um, this is a rally in 1968, uh, Lake Merritt, uh, April, so after King is killed. And again, you sort of see it's the Peace and Freedom Party, it's, you know, it's a coalition, it's anti-war, but it's also, also of course, Huey Newton, Bobby Seal, you know, Black Panther uh, representation. Um, here is a bulletin, not the, the, the Black Panther newspaper, but a, a bulletin, which I, I is fairly obscure, an incidental publication. Interestingly, on the cover, you have these sort of seven white guys, so I think one may be uh, Latino, uh, but they're the Oakland Seven. The Oakland Seven are uh, mostly Berkeley-based student activists who were Really led an escalation of resistance to the Vietnam War from protest to resistance that is taking a much more direct action. This is in 69, this flyer, they faced the trial for this. And again, it's showing these connections. So you have the third world movements basically very much in solidarity with, uh, you know, going both ways. You have the counterculture, Steve Miller Band here doing a benefit for um, the Open Seven. Uh, Matt Callahan's uh, book, which I think is on the PM Press table, is an incredible document of the ways in which the musical counterculture and the underground 
bands and so on from the 60s were very much a part of the anti-war movement and the various social movements. So I think that's one of the strongest sort of mismemories uh, of the 60s is that this counterculture and, and social movements were separate uh, in, that, in that way. Um, the other great myth of the, of the 60s, I think really especially coming from the right, but I've heard this as common sense from surprising sources, is this idea that the anti-war movement was against the GIs, right? And the famous story being, you know, hippies spitting on GIs, which never happened. People research it. You know, the, 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 the disdain for the GIs came from the right, right? From right-wing veterans who said, well, you guys have didn't win the war, and now you've got long hair, and you're smoking weed, or whatever. So there was a lot of animosity, but, you know, the evidence shows that it's not coming from the anti-war movement. And the examples, again, this is going back as far as 66, Certainly, there were uh, the peace movement was the first movement, you know, with the people in America to really reach out to the, the soldiers. Um, and in particular, uh, many of the rebellions, this is the Fort Hood Three, there were many rebellions uh, from on duty personnel, and these rebellions were often especially led by, by people of color, specifically, say, African Americans. Uh, this is a photo from 1971. Uh, anti-war march led by uh, sailors from the USS Coral Sea. SOS is Save Our Ship, right? So this again is people in, uh, from within the military taking the lead, leadership of the anti-war movement. And very important, um, you know, this is, yeah, some more evidence of this. The Chicano movement in particular, George mentioned earlier about how well, the Chicano moratorium in Los Angeles in 1970 was an anti-war uh, protest, right? So these are all flyers from UC Berkeley showing, again, the various, what we now think of, I think, in the sort of Democratic Party ornamental multiculturalism moment where every, you know, identity politics are kept separate, uh, you know, uh, we sort of forget that they were all really coming out of finding voice uh, through this commonality of struggle, which uh, was really in opposition. So here we have, okay, we think of Ch Chicano movement, Latino movement, it's, it's part of the anti-war movement. It's also, of course, part of the labor movement. And here we have <clears throat> United Farm Workers, maybe one of the more famous labor struggles. And this is, you know, a UC Berkeley uh, campus worker strike um, with a reference to the Wobbly, you, you know, the, the Wobbly slogan. Um, Hello. Uh, the League of Black Revolutionary, Revolution of Black Workers coming to Berkeley as a flyer. Um, again, thinking of class struggle, and the element of labor, this came up in the last uh, conversation, yes, it was, it was always a part of the consciousness of this time, of the imagination of this period. Of the Native American occupation of Alcatraz, uh, and so again, this idea of occupation, of, of, you know, we think of Occupy is the most recent iteration. What's significant to me is I've lived through so many occupations, just in my own uh, relatively short life, I not remember in the 60s, and it seems like every era, 80s, 90s, there's going to be an occupation, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, again, striking to me the lack of historical memory of around the previous occupation. For example, in the anti apartheid movement at Berkeley, Sparrow Plaza was, was renamed Pico Plaza, and it was occupied for a good two months, and all the same problems that, that occurred during Occupy, Oakland, or wherever, occurred then. Uh, many years earlier, and of course they occurred at Alcatraz, which was a year and a half occupation. <clears throat> this, I think, is especially interesting flyer. It was one of the earliest mentions of women's liberation that I found. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry for the lamination. I didn't know I was photographing these props. So I, there's, there's thousands of these, so I just you know didn't take them out of the, mm -hmm. the sleeves. But this is a so it's it's an early women's liberation movement flyer, but it's it's women's liberation in support of the third world strike. And the third world strike is that kind of big bang moment of, of um, what's now, I think, called somewhat often disparagingly identity politics. You know, so specifically this, this eruption of, of voices that had, you know, been, been, been invisible. And so clearly, you know, this idea that, you know, hegemonic white bourgeois feminism was only concerned with certain issues was not the case, you know, at the, at the base level in places where the flame was hottest, such as UC Berkeley. Um, and this is a couple of years later, where you can sort of see women's liberation was not separate from you know, these other uh, struggles. In this case, third world solidarity, internationalism, the liberation struggles um, taking place in uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America. Um, Asian American movement mentioned specifically that each of these movements has its own strand. Specifically to the Asian American movement is the fact that the United States had fought <clears throat> genocidal wars, virtually genocidal in terms of the, the uh, consequences, 
uh, for many decades, right? Really, four places. I mean, Philippines, uh, Japan, you know, you know China, well, fighting Chinese troops in Korea, and Vietnam, and Southeast Asia. So I mean, here we have it's a feminist march, it's anti-war, and it's support of Asian sisters. Again, class dimension of the uh, of the feminist movement here. It's not it's not uh, incidental. It was not. Um, People's Park, uh, 1969, huge march, um, lots of labor support. There's the ILWU banner supporting the People's Park and in the troop zone. Uh, environmental movement, again, this is the Bolinas oil spill, or you know, the, the thing that sort of founds Bolinas. And so the relationship between ecology, that awareness, and the more of an anti capitalist perspective is present. And here we get into, I wanted to show some, some countercultural stuff, and also showing the mix of things from the 60s. This is really, this. It so chills when they discover this. And I think it's very important to understand that when you have a milieu, this is truly the dark side, there were, there are, uh, you know, players, elements that one, uh, you know, should give one pause and wonder, you know, that the People's Temple and Jim Jones, we know the horrific things that happened, was part of the social movement with fellow travelers. As my father would just pick up these documents, you know, from, from the events. Uh, very, very creepy. Uh, I thought this was interesting because it's, it's just, you know, there's so much going on, but here it's a, it's a statement of a Marcusean revolutionary perspective against Eastern religion. I thought, wow, what is this, you know? <laughs> Again, showing the ferment of ideas and how uh, there is, uh, I have no idea what this character is, uh, but, you know, there is, um, what's striking to me is, is the things that filter through, uh, through our memory, and in particular, the way, the efficacy of their use for what I think is the much more deeply forgotten history of the last 40 years. Um, again, the coquettes and the you know, and the challenge of, to science, right? I think a movement that's really neglected is the crushing of science. And this comes out of the Vietnam War, but also feminism, and their basic struggles. So this was a, you know, I think something we really need again, especially with the kind of utopianism around tech, you know, the false utopianism around you know, technical tech solutions. So really problematizing science, again, classic debates uh, at the time. Uh, <laughs> Marxism was in the ascendancy, but in you know, my lifetime, anarchism has been. But this is an ongoing sort of ideological dialogue. Different solidarities, I'm almost done here, I'll just go through these, you know, IRA, of course, Irish struggle, the Greek fascist coup, and you have all these solidarities, the movements coming out for each other. <coughs> and this is interesting, you know, the house band of the Black Panther Party, the Lumpen, this is a 1971 benefit for the Arab Students Association, right? Uh, and my father always said, on all the student movements he witnessed, by far the most impressive were the Iranian students, uh, because there are so many of them. That's the whole story of why were there so many Iranian students in the U.S. and Germany. The Shah didn't want them in Iran. Uh, they did a lot of organizing, you know, in the Bay Area. Uh, you know, here we have again with the Asian movement, the Chinese movement, 1919 anniversary. In Chinatown, you know, you can think, well, this is, has to do with Chinese politics, but you see a lot of non-Chinese people participating, you know, again, in this, in this moment, solidarity. Again, anti-apartheid, there were two movements, you know, at, at Berkeley that were you know, very large, but here's the 1977 movement, and you have also on the flyer uh, the Baki decision, you know, affirmative action, this right-wing attack, you know, which is ongoing uh, you know, on campuses. So again, the very conscious effort to, to connect the issues, Right, uh, I think that was a legacy of the '60s. That uh, um, you know, I look at this is the night of March, East March, big one, Dolores Park, and it's it's you know it's anti-apartheid, but it's also the big labor battles of the mid '80s, Watsonville and Hormel strikes. Um, this is the Democratic Convention in 1984, and one of the one of the other legacies I think of the '60s was using conventions as a site of struggle. We think of Fannie Lou Hamer in '64, Democratic Convention, then of course '68. But I think 84 in San Francisco, the Bay Area, really should be remembered in all sorts of ways. Uh, for one thing, a new form of counterculture that is really where the punk and the you know, anarchist tendencies from, you know, really become more uh, visible and, and really have a new sort of element. There are new sort of things under the sun, not speaking of fashion. Uh, last slide here is just, okay, yeah, impeachment, we don't think of it as a mass movement, but there were some, you know, participatory <laughs> actions. Um, so, but to conclude, um, and I'm sorry for the whirlwind tour through, through this, I uh, just wanted to sort of maybe stimulate or overstimulate our, our minds and eyes with uh, some sense of the breadth of not just that 60s, but really the last 
uh, really the last 50 years uh, of, of, um, of, uh, of resistance, uh, resistance to a changing um, system. I think one of the things that maybe to conclude, just maybe one minute, that that the movements uh, are sort of compared to the 60s. It's often, I think, an unfair comparison. That is, current generations of students feel that they can't possibly do what students did in the 60s, and they can't because of the level of debt, right? The economic situation has been more. Um, and so maybe I'll leave it at that. I just wanted to open it up for the questions around what, what's less well remembered and what what um, are the are the uh, uh, burdens of only of remembering this period uh, at, at possibly at the expense of of a, of a more uh, telescope view of including more of the last 50 years um, uh, in not being making a bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm sure there's all kinds of interesting reflections and questions and thoughts going on. Uh, there's so much content to this panel that I think we're going to air on passing out index cards and inviting people to write a uh, jot a question down. I have a box of pen and a large stack of index cards, so a couple of people are going to help me pass those out. Uh, and then in just a minute, we're going to go, or I guess we can get started now as we're doing that, <laughs> multitasking, um, to a very rich talk by, uh, thank you so much for coming, these wonderful speakers, um, introduce Walter Chernoff. Uh, I don't really think that I probably don't need a microphone. I think my voice is uh, loud or louder than enough and um, I was ruminating over this uh, particular topic in a, a couple of different ways. And, uh, one of course is uh, when someone asks you to speak about Africa, uh, they're asking you to speak about the continent essentially is four times the size of the United States. Um, so you're behind the eight ball uh, immediately. Um, I, I guess the other part of it is this, this kind of meshing here of the relationship between, or if there is a relationship between black nationalism, uh, pan-Africanism, etc. I, I, I note that there's a, a conference which is scheduled for uh, this year, actually scheduled for December of this year, where there's going to be a celebration in fact, of the All African People's Conference. And one of the topics that's actually part of that particular conference is a discussion about Pan Africanism. And this is, you know, the conference, of course, that Kwame Nkrumah uh, was part of when he came into office in 1957 in, uh, in Ghana. So it's, it's a topic which uh, is constantly floating, constantly moving, uh, different sets of, of narrative. I, I think of a uh, when the topic came to me, I was actually uh, traveling in uh, West Africa. I was in uh, Senegal and Mauritania uh, in the last month or so. Uh, the previous to that, I've been in, in Ghana, uh, but mostly over the last 15 to 20 years, I've spent most of my time in uh, Cuba and Venezuela and Colombia, but I've been a lot of many different parts of Africa, including working in Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. And when we were talking about utopia and dreaming and imagine, uh, there is this uh, film, uh, which is entitled Free on my, Freedom on My Mind, uh, which is done by a local Bay Area filmmaker, Connie Field, uh, who would also did a seven-part series, I think, on South Africa, uh, Rosie to River Tour, uh, <coughs> etc. And there's a line in there, uh, as they're looking at this period of the 1960s, and one of the uh, African-American women in the South, who's part of this particular struggle, is saying at some point, um, you know, how she had this ideal of maybe growing up and having a, a, a white picket fence and those type of things, and a little house and garden. And she goes on to say, you know, it's, it's difficult to dream about things that you can't even imagine. And you, you see in some senses this period that we're talking about the 1960s is, is that ability to imagine, that ability uh, to give those communities, those African American communities, those communities in the Africa and the Africa. And, and again, you're, you're dealing a lot here. I, I think it's a unique situation. I didn't spend enough time thinking about it over the last uh, uh, few weeks to uh, come up the, with the uniqueness of it. But when you're talking about the African diaspora, uh, 
often we don't uh, capitalize that more African people go to the Americas and go to the Caribbean than ever come to North America. So when, you, when you're talking about the African diaspora, uh, you give Professor Turner a big task. Uh, not only are we talking about those people who we find here in North America, but throughout Central America and South America and the Caribbean, uh, the Trinidad, the Tobago, the Haiti, the uh, Venezuela, uh, et cetera. I was surprised a few years ago uh, in terms of traveling through Colombia and having the opportunity to talk with people who live in the coastal region of Colombia, those Afro-Colombian communities who are under uh, tremendous pressure at this point. I I'll start a bit with, um, as long as my time goes, I'll, I'll talk. I'll, I'll talk a bit about something about which I think bridges some of the energies of the 1960s. And then I'll talk a bit perhaps about uh, where I think some of the voices and imagination came from uh, in the 1960s, talking to El Haj Malik El Shabazz, better known as Malcolm X. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit perhaps about some of uh, the, 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 the trials and tribulations that were part of the uh, Pan-Africanist movement on the on the African on the African continent, and certainly there's a number of conferences, uh, but there's a number of key events. I think there's a number of, of, of turning points, and then maybe to say something about uh, some of the other hidden pieces uh, that were part not only of what was going on among uh, the African American communities, uh, but also on the African continent. I I was a person uh, who was a member of the Black Panther Party, so I'll roll through through that to some degree. Uh, part of my visit uh, to Senegal and Mauritania was to uh, be in touch with a group of people who are referred to as Africans Rising. And uh, you, you don't, uh, one of the things I, I'm saddened a bit about uh, Africa as I go through my garage and see these stacks and stacks and stacks of Africa magazines in Southern Africa and Africa, Asia, etc., is that you know, generally this notion of the African continent speaking for African people, it's, it's a bit less over the last 10 or 15 years, you can search for pieces on water or on, uh, on different issues, but the continental view of, of what Kwame Nkrumah talked about, or what Patrice Emery Lumumba talked about is a bit less. Africans rising um, is something I think that along with the things that we're seeing uh, in the Black Lives Matter, the movement for black lives, and uh, we don't know enough. Um, there's so much going on with the movement for black lives. Um, that doesn't make it, I mean, obviously the United States doesn't have the media, so uh, it's hard to get any information about anything. Uh, but certainly when you take a look at, uh, I, I, there's some synergy there, there's some things there that are giving people opportunities to dream, there's some new voices, uh, new feminist voices, black feminist voices, there's some new uh, structures which are making a difference. African Rising comes out of a series of meetings in 2016, I believe is the date, uh, which were held in a Kilimanjaro in East Africa. And there were actually two sets of meetings. Uh, one was a, uh, a group of uh, women from all over the African continent, approximately 400 women who gathered together. Uh, I think 30 or 40 of them marched up to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, no easy feat, and came back and crafted a declaration on issues of gender, and property, and voices, etc. I'd be the first one to say uh, that I think the voices of of women, the voices of gender, they're coming from the African continent, are among the most powerful voices I've heard over the last five to, to 10 years. Uh, I've been doing interviews for maybe mm, 25 or 30 years uh, here in other parts of the world, and uh, increasingly over the last eight to 10 years, I've had an opportunity to interview more and more of women who are coming from the African continent and talk about the work that's being, being done. Uh, that was one part of Kilimanjaro. The other was this notion that came out of what I'm referring to as Africa's Rising, um, where there was a declaration essentially saying we are the citizens and descendants of Africa as part of the African Rising movement, are outraged um, by the centuries of oppression, we condemn the plunder of our natural and mineral resources and the suppression of our fundamental human rights. And when I was in uh, Dakar, I was working with a organization, it's a social science think tank, it's called Codestria. And Codestria basically is a continent-wide organization that deals with political, economic, and, and, uh, and social issues. And the people I was working with and discussing, they had just returned from uh, two countries, uh, which are crucial to understand what's going on in contemporary Africa. One is the country of Cameroon, 
uh, which we don't receive a lot of news about, but which is a serious set of developments in, in Cameroon. Uh, Cameroon was one of those territories that prior to the Berlin Conference 1885 or so, uh, was divided up between German areas and between British areas. Uh, later it became a British and uh, uh, French territory, uh, some recent decision, uh, but there's been some internal revolts and conflicts uh, around what's happening in Cameroon. And the other country is the country, of course, of, of Togo. So Africans Rising has been very, very active around these issues. And it really represents the voices of young people. It really represents the voices of uh, workers. These are the same people who spoke up uh, during the Marikani events in 2012 in South Africa with the mine workers. Uh, these are the same people who were part of uh, We've Had Enough, uh, which was a movement that was able to run Abdullah Wai out of the country of uh, Senegal. Uh, these are the same people who uh, were part of the Fees Must Fall, uh, Roads Must Fall movements that we heard about in South Africa. And these, as I say, they're mostly young people, but they've been active in Uganda. They've been uh, giving pushback on uh, legislation to criminalize the same-sex relationship. They were the same people after 2007 who spoke up about what happened in the failed Kenyan election. They're the same people who were part of what we call the Occupy Nigeria movement, which happened very shortly after events in here. I, I think one of the, uh, when those of us who were black nationalists, and I'm always saying here that we were always black nationalists. Uh, the 1960s gave us an opportunity to be pan-Africanists, and it gave us an opportunity to be more and engage more in issues of being anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist. These weren't new features in the African-American community. I mean, if you trace back to the uh, Pan-Africanist Congress of Henry Sylvester Williams, they go back to the period of 1900. If you take a look at the work of people like W.B. Du Bois or Shirley Graham Du Bois, uh, who found themselves uh, in Africa and the country of Ghana very early on, uh, Martin Luther King uh, attends the uh, celebration of independence in uh, Ghana in uh, in Venice. Uh, Martin Luther King attended the uh, celebration of uh, uh, independence in uh, Ghana in 1957. And of course, uh, Bill Sutherland, who had written a very good book, uh, which is entitled Guns and Gandhi. Uh, Bill Sutherland was very active not only uh, on the west coast of uh, Africa, etc. And, and, and Malcolm X talked about in the last message. Malcolm X made four visits to, uh, to Africa. He made two in 1964. Uh, he gives a speech which is a speech which is a, a classic speech uh, raising the issues of imperialism and anti-colonialism, which is a speech which is entitled The Last Message. And in there he says after 59, 1959, uh, the Bandung Conference of 1955, the Afro-Asian Conference, as it's called, this issue of colonialism, that France began to make moves to uh, get out of French West Africa, that Belgium began to move out of the Congo, uh, that Britain began to make moves to get out of Kenya and Tanzania, a number of other things. And Malcolm asked very directly, uh, even with those particular notions, what effect did this have on, uh, on African American? Uh, one of the things that Malcolm uh, does engage with a lot is this discussion, uh, which really is a, a turning point, uh, which are the events of 1960, 1961 uh, in the Belgian Congo uh, with the uh, murder, the assassination of, uh, of Patrice Lumumba. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah has written a fantastic series of correspondence back and forth uh, between himself and between the United Nations and Dow Hammarskjöld, etc., which is entitled Challenge of the Congo, uh, as everything was being done to try to address uh, what was happening in the, uh, in the Congo. Uh, that Patrice Lumumba, who was the uh, rightful prime minister, uh, was being bamboozled uh, not only by uh, the secessionist forces, which were located in Katanga uh, and Chombe, uh, and later Mobutu, the coup of Mobutu in 1965, uh, where Mobutu stayed there up until 1997. But he talked about the complicity of the United States, particularly Kennedy and, and many others. One of the things that I worked on when I was a member of the Black Panther uh, newspaper, I joined just out of, uh, out of high school uh, and became very, very active in the party. Uh, I was fortunate in that uh, the chapter of our particular party, the captain of our party, actually had uh, been very, very close to uh, both uh, Alprentice Munchie Carter, who was one of the first people assassinated in the Black Panther Party in 1969. It kind of drew a line there between what people referred to as cultural nationalism and revolutionary nationalism. 
the Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party was more attacked uh, than any other party. More deaths occurred in that particular party than any other party. And we found ourselves, and I think it was interesting for us thinking about things that you don't um, think of. Uh, we found ourselves working with organizations like the Peace and Freedom Party, organizations like the White Panther Party. And when interviewing people who've been in the party, they said this was a, this was a whole new thing to them. Um, this was something they had, get, had to get used to. They had come from traditions of working with Marcus Garvey. They had come from black community organizations and a number of other things. Uh, I also worked with a center which was called the Africa uh, Resource Center, which was in, in Oakland. To give you some historical background, there's two images I'll do, I think, with the next uh, few minutes that I have here, and then I'll, I think I'll be fairly close to, uh, close to time. <clears throat> that, those struggles that we see in Africa, it's, it's, it's deceptive to some degree. Um, I think we see what came out of it, and I think what we see coming out of it now is what we see with Africans rising. But when, in 1960, there were only eight African countries that were independent. Uh, Ghana was, uh, Ghana and Guinea were the most recent. So when Kwame Nkrumah called for the Conference of Independent African State, and then 1958 for the All African Peoples, uh, a conference, some of the main spokespeople of, uh, of the liberation movement, Hastings Banda, Jomo Kenyatta, they were there. Patrice Lumumba uh, was there. There's a second and there's a third conference in, in Tunis, I think, and then there's another one actually which comes back to, uh, to Ghana. There were tensions then. The important point is that by the time that the 1960s have ended, there are 25 coups or self-coups on the African continent. And some of the key people, such as uh, Felix Mume of Cameroon, uh, he is assassinated in Switzerland. Uh, Modi Bokieta, another socialist leader, uh, he has run out of power before the end of the 1960s. And Kwame Nkrumah, who's on his way to try to be engaged with the events in Vietnam, he is overthrown in 1966. I'll leave that one piece there. The other piece I think is important, I, I, didn't, I didn't walk through all of them, uh, today, uh, but if, if you look at some of the uh, Black Panther newspapers, I won't open them in the best interest of time. Uh, one of the things that the media did, that the Black Panther newspaper did, the Pittsburgh Courier did, the Amsterdam News was, that there were constantly images about these international faces. So if you open the Black Panther part, you're going to see Priest Pilumba, you're going to see Mao Zedong, you're going to see Che Guevara, uh, Stokely Carmichael always, off, often goes, of course, to the uh, uh, Latin American States Conference in 1960, uh, 1967. Um, and there was going to be constant feeds about Zimbabwe and Angola, etc. So we became Pan-Africanists to, to seeing this type of information. Uh, I, at some point, was working laying out the paper. I used to go to West Oakland and lay out the paper. And you would constantly see these images. Um, we read The Wretched of the Earth, we read Engels, we read Marx, we read everything in this particular period of history. And, and to conclude, um, with this notion of imagination, we can talk about it later, is there, was a, there was a cultural focus too, which made a, big, a major difference here. The 1960, what is it, the 1969 conference, which was held uh, in uh, Algiers, in Algeria, uh, which was the Pan-Africanist Congress, which is this one here where you had people such as uh, Archie Shep, and this gentleman here is actually my good friend George Gaines, uh, Masai Hewitt, who was there, uh, the Chicago Art Ensemble. All of these things were things that moved the African-American movement, gave us a chance to continue to be black nationalists, to still have the focus on the survival program, which were part of the party, but to begin to look at Cuba, begin to look at Venezuela, begin to look at Haiti, begin to look at, uh, at Africa. COINTELPRO takes a tremendous toll on the movement in 1968 and, 19, uh, and 1969. But it gave us that opportunity to imagine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so when you uh, expand the focus a little bit, if that's possible, from these already very rich global talks uh, from the Bay Area to Pan-Africanism to the planet for a moment, bringing us up 
more into the full dynamics of the present and put a focus on political ecology, which uh, some people think of as a, a quintessential, very important academic or scholarly discipline for the 21st century in the sense that it can bring together, in theory, uh, social justice, economics, politics, and now uh, new layers of concerns about earth systems and ecological survival. And I take full blame, or credit, however you look at it, for including the word utopia in this panel. I think it's been very clear from the first two talks the extent to which any use of the word utopia, given the, 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 um, what, how we need to change society, uh, has to be extraordinarily complex, dialectical, uh, sort of beyond our imagination, apparently, in terms of the progress that we're making. Uh, and yet I use it again, uh, also in Frederick Jameson's sense. I add to that a little bit. And, Jameson's sense of the term, as I understand it, is that it is a tool or a function with which to leverage political change. The idea being that you can't make the kind of true systemic deep-rooted changes you need, as these talks abundantly make clear, without uh, the imagination to think um, above and beyond and outside. Um, sorry, I lost my track here. Oh, and I learned this morning um, because I think, when I think of my sense of the, the word utopia, to which I would just add that I still see in my talk the layer of systems and complex thought that has been developed in some ways over the last 50 years has to be integrated into the way we think about and fight for a better world. So the 1968 slogan, Be Realistic, Demand the Impossible, uh, I see as capturing this, and I learned this morning may have come directly from Marcuse, and um, carries with it this implicit acknowledgement of the need to dream beyond. I think when I talk about systems and complexity, very briefly, a way to look at our true struggle today, the true magnitude of, of it, is that we still have many or most of the social struggles that we had in the 1960s but on top of that, we now have the feedbacks or blowbacks of ecological and economic struggles. So, of course, there's been advance and progress in various ways, but as we touched on this morning, in some real material ways, inequality in the USA today is worse now than in 1968, and yet we're also facing things like global warming. I will try to inject some, some um, hope and positive <laughs> or constructive thinking into this. So, um, it's important to be able to... to um, step back and, and get a sense of this. If we were to step out and imagine ourselves as, say, space aliens looking down, one thing that would be very obvious is that more rich and powerful actors in the world today are not very good at just organizing society. Um, sure, for the profit of very few for the very short term, but for the majority, and now over, um, over time, even for the few. I think that's one of the things that's changed most today from 1968. So the story of 1968 can be seen partly in terms of the framing. How successfully were people at the time able to frame um, around more modern framing, atomistic, isolated, different groups, uh, concepts of control and domination that come out of uh, modernistic thought in the West, for example towards organizing society more in terms of solidarities, the commons, the common good. I'm going to give just two examples to, uh, to look at this in a little more detail. And they both show up, these different aspects, but, um, but you'll see from, from what I say. So um, one of the biggest strengths I find from the 1968 era was the way in which so many people in so many places called for solidarities, which has come up a lot. Conversely, one of the biggest weaknesses of that era was that even at a moment when there was such a call for unity, such a call for a global perspective, such a call to unite struggles, uh, even more than the, the radical left had in previous generations, perhaps, um, conversely, there were still very powerful uh, people and groups who were sometimes framing in a very simplistic, a very narrow way. I'm not really one in talks to focus too much on uh, critiquing, especially individuals. I'm interested in the construction, but I think it, 
in 2018, it's very important to look at what are some of the flaws in our thinking of the 1960s that remain with us today and are still really significant problems in our thinking. And so it's with that spirit that I'm going to do a little bit deeper critique than I usually do. So um, the first example is uh, Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb. This came out in 1968. It was a bestseller. It sold millions of copies. It was translated in many languages. And um, the book predicted mass global population crash in the 1970s. So on the one hand, within 10 years, the book was pretty much debunked. The main thesis was uh, debunked. Um, so it's interesting. The funny part of it is that he took all the credit for authoring this book. Actually, it was co-written with his wife. And you would think that after it had been debunked, that maybe then he would have given credit. <laughs> but sadly, he was very dogged in defending the core thesis. And even today, in 2018, he's given a number of talks in which he still defends the core thesis that, um, of the significance and central role of population. At the time, he said, overpopulation is now the dominant problem in all our personal, national, and international planning. Um, and again, there's something, if we can find, we need to find humor, right? That we can find humor in this, um, if it weren't so tra tragic. And that is that um, those folks who remain the most obsessed about uh, population growth of the world's poorest population, uh, statistically speaking, tend to be um, older, wealthy white males. And the funny part is that really, if we think about it, overpopulation may be the only problem that cannot be partially blamed on the older white male. And I'm joking about this, but I think it's significant. We all have blind spots. Mm. We all have uh, issues with point of view and what allows us to see most clearly from different points of view. And the fact that this has remained today so uh, such a strong issue is, is, is alarming because the statistics are glaring um, when we break them down, which I'll, which I'll do in a moment. Um, so we even have for example, today, James Lovelock, you know, renowned scientist, saying that overpopulation and climate change are two sides of one coin, quote. It, it, it almost can't be farther from the truth. Um, and when the book first came out, it said in the, in the byline, uh, no one can do any rational personal planning, uh, nor can public policy be resolved in any area unless one first takes into account the, quote, population law. Um, it goes on to say, Paul Ehrlich, a qualified scientist, clearly describes the dimensions of the crisis in all aspects, etc. So first of all, uh, we know now from various studies that fossil fuel use is greatest amongst the population, uh, the people who repopulate the least. So people who have the lowest population growth are using by far the highest uh, fossil fuels, and vice versa. There's almost a sixth of the world's poorest population uses virtually no fossil fuels and is contributing almost not at all to climate change. If you look at the Saunders-Boxer Climate Protection Act, which they wrote in 2013, which is, I think, a very good piece of um, legislation, one of the things they point to is that just 3,800 entities in the world spew out over 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So under 4,000 entities in the world are emitting over 80%. And climate science will tell us that's around the number we need to, to, to rein this in. If we could rein in that 80%, we'd have, <laughs> we'd have a better chance. So, uh, and you can imagine that includes oil companies, other multinational companies, military states, etc., the Davos Club. Um, we know now that we've reached such an extreme that even as of 2017, eight men own as much wealth as 50% of the planet, which is, you know, it's just mind-boggling, right? Um, but the thing is, um, it's not just that uh, you know blaming the poor you know it just puts the lie to blaming the poor, but that the story of blaming the poor has also allowed us to continue five decades of enriching the rich. You know that stories um, stories can predominate and, and hide things. So a few things: one, hidden in plain sight, um, which another thing which I which maybe we haven't fully come to terms with today which is that the book claims that, that the author is qualified. But, of course, uh, Ehrlich is a biologist, an extremely good biologist, a lepidopterist, studies checkerfly butterflies. Um, but I think we do need to look at how do we give legitimacy and 
why do we, when do we, and how do we easily give legitimacy? Um, there are many extremely qualified people who have focused more on the depth, an in depth knowledge of society, economics, politics, etc. Um, and just to give a few, few details on that, um, in recent years, uh, Ehrlich has begun to incorporate some of the critiques, presumably from some of his, you know, the main critics, including things like, oh, we need to redistribute wealth or have greater consideration to uh, fight racism. But these stories are in some sense antithetical. So, you know, blaming a, a large percentage of the world's poor, you can't sort of then at the same time do anti-racist work. You have to articulate those two things. And a lot of thinkers, I think of Vijay Prashad, has talked about how it's not just a question of suddenly coming along and redistributing wealth. We can't just count on, um, on um, the benefit of some but of allowing the self-organizational self autonomy of various peoples. So uh, there's examples all over the world of this that seem very, very clear. One example um, that I would point to is in Zambia, where there's a copper belt, and um, multinational comp companies there are kind of going at a great rate of um, extracting wealth and leaving behind decimation. We know this is just one of many, many stories, right? So, in a sense, if you look at the, the, the on-the-ground struggle of a place like that, where people are trying to defend their lands against the decimation of foreign companies, it's not really, uh, redistribution of wealth would not help in a way. What you need is a lack of the, of the racism and justification in the first place behind going in and preventing the autonomy of local peoples to take care of and organize things as they have been for centuries or millennia. Just to give a couple more, um, facts to sort of drive home the, the point. Um, this statistic really shocked me. I got it from a British journalist, uh, but I looked it up and it seems to hold up, which is that one yacht, one luxury yacht, burns more fossil fuels in one hour than an average African from the African continent burns in a lifetime. And that's 31 kilometers, uh, 31 liters per kilometer. But then when we, when we add things in there, like the fact that the yacht is lined with teak and mahogany and the folks are throwing back caviar and swordfish and, and Dom Perignon, um, which I have nothing against those particular things, but when we look at the carbon cyclic footprint of all of that, um, the whole life cycle emissions add yet on top of that. But on top of that, it's also about what we do uh, or what companies do when they go to places, so, and what's included in statistics. So even that statistic of the yacht and uh, the, the usage of fossil fuels by an African in a lifetime, I'm not sure it includes certain very important things. For example, the uh, gas flaring in the Niger Delta, this is another shocking statistic, emits more greenhouse gases than all of Sub-Saharan Africa. So just the waste just the logic of a capitalist corporation in a place like the Niger Delta is producing more greenhouse gas emissions, driving global warming faster than the entire population of sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the kind of fact we have to keep in mind when, when someone says, well-meaningly, well-intentionally, we need only a billion people on the planet and that will fix everything. Um, maybe that would be great, but we also need those 4,000 companies or entities to start working very quickly um, at cooperating around things like climate justice. So uh, to, to conclude that piece of the talk, you know, it's not sex, it's money, um, it's not the poor. I mean, the greatest driver, the 80% of emissions, it's, it's, it's rich folks and structures and institutions and ideas um, that we perpetuate that keep some of those types of things in place. And now I will turn to a slightly more optimistic thing, which is my second example. It's also flawed, it also is a product of its era. The report known as The Limits to Growth, which came out in 1972, actually when you read the preamble of that, the authors also, the very first thing they put the blame on is uh, global population in other countries. And there are some framing issues and um, there are 
you know, one of the things that interests me is if we take the limits to growth on one hand and then all of the incredible flyers and messaging of the radical movements of the 60s and 70s on the other, how big is the disconnect? Where is the disconnect? And there's a huge disconnect. And again, the point of view, there's not uh, this, there's this blind spot, this incapacity to look at the role of one's own class and privilege. Mm -hmm. And so the authors of The Limits to Growth certainly did not call out in any systemic way the role of um, the um, spiraling you know, uh, global, global economic growth, right? Um, the the, the uh, specifics behind that. But they did focus on growth itself. And so even though it wasn't matched, it wasn't linked or wedded to a, a whole political economic analysis in the way that some of the you know, student movement and worker movements were doing, they nailed it in a certain way. And their scientific models were surprisingly good. A number of labs in the last 15, 20 years have reproduced the models, the scenarios of the uh, limits to growth. And especially the scenario that they call business as usual has held up remarkably well. They did actually a very good job of looking at that. One can sum up um, the whole thesis of the limits to growth report in a, a sentence from a, a polymath, a, an interesting thinker, Kenneth Boulding, who, as an aside, I find interesting. During one career, he was president, not just of one, but of five different uh, disciplinary academic associations, one of which was the American Economics Association, of which he was one of the more, I think, um, enlightened presidents for a while. And the phrase you've probably all heard, anyone who thinks you can have infinite growth on a finite planet is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Part of the reason why the growth story is so strong is that there's a double whammy there, which we're finding out very quickly in studies looking at the way the Anthropocene has feedbacks of social ideas and institutions. That you're not only destroying carbon sinks, but you're doing that while you're creating carbon emissions and carbon sources. And again, I would say that one of the key things here is that these stories are, in many ways, interrelated but incompatible. That uh, if you have the dominance of the population story, there's, you cannot also get the full story of the nature of growth, comprehending that, teasing apart the structures that are behind that, and how to address it. So I would ask, sort of coming full circle, uh, as a punchline to this talk, um, you know, where are the movements today where people are adequately, directly addressing the role of the most powerful and rich in global overshoot and collapse? Because at this point, we are facing that. I found hauntingly, uh, beautifully uh, evocative of this over the years, one, a few sentences that were, I believe, uh, from the, some of the last thing that Dr. Martin Luther King wrote and published in this um, book, Where Do We Go From Here, which may have even been written in 67 or 68, I'm not sure. Um, but when I hear it, I hear my, my work in this and I hear this kind of more complex story of can we organize as a species um, in a way that's um, that takes into account our interdependence at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And Dr. King wrote in 1968, which we could say as well today, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life only leads us standing here, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. This may well be humankind's last chance to choose between chaos or community. Thank you. So we have a good amount of time. If people want to bring up cards, um, I will quickly glance through and look for good questions. Uh, we have such expertise on the panel today. so. Don't be shy with your questions. If you write a manifesto, I may, may not be able to 
make it out on the little card, but shorter points. I had not really thought much about the fact that in the digital age, handwriting can be a potential. <laughs> I'll start with this question. Um, what factors led to the collapse of the Black Panther Party, and can Black Lives Matter avoid a similar end? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. It's a very difficult uh, question. Uh, I, would, I would suggest for people who are taking a look at uh, Black Lives Matter that you uh, take a look at a recent book by uh, Barbara Ransby, uh, who is a professor from the University of Illinois. Uh, she wrote a very good, uh, two very excellent pieces. Uh, one was her book on uh, Ella Baker, uh, which was the story of Ella Baker, the, one of the conveners of SNCC in 1960. And her other book was uh, titled Islanda, uh, which was the story of the wife of the of Paul Robeson. And she walks through the text very honestly with a good deal of transparency and talks about some of the challenges of Black Lives Matter, some of the challenges of being able to have uh, black feminist voices, uh, and where the roots of this recent movement come from. Uh, she starts back with um, the response in the African American communities in the 90s uh, to the impact of AIDS, the death that came from AIDS, and then she moves up very quickly to Trayvon Martin, and looks at Ferguson, looks at Eric Garner, so she does a very good job there, you know, looking at issues of money, issues of politics, issues of patriarchy, uh, how to sustain movements, how to prevent burnout, etc. I would encourage you to read it. Um, I spoke with her last week. Probably, I, I think if uh, George here I know knows my good friend, uh, one of the things that Kathleen Cleaver would always uh, say, well I knew Kathleen when she lived over on Pine Street, she would say, well you know, most of the people in the party were very, very uh, young. There were very few people in the party who were older than 20 years old, and you had some of that that came along with it. Uh, Kathleen was older, George Gaines was older, Munchie Carter was older, Sekou Sundiata uh, um, Kodi was older, but generally people were very, 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 very young. Um, one part I think certainly is COINTELPRO was just absolutely uh, devastating in the Black Panther Party. Uh, my first political education teacher uh, Mr. Fred Bennett, uh, his body was discovered in the Santa Cruz Mountains. There was information, disinformation, uh, so that took a tremendous uh, toll. Um, the other piece I think that I would say, and was going to, responding actually to something that both of you had, had said, is that in that period of time, two things hit us very hard. One was that uh, we were made to seem bigger and more powerful than we were. Uh, when J. Edgar Hoover in 1969 said the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States, obviously it wasn't true, uh, but it created a series of energies, particularly within law enforcement, the other thing. I think the other thing was something that we had no idea, and you can see it in some of uh, Eddie's slides, that when we were mobilizing, the people were going to turn out the way that they did. And it was, over, it was overwhelming like for the breakfast for children. People would turn out in numbers, the numbers of kids. Uh, Peace and Freedom Party, White Panther Party. I mean, some of it was actually overwhelming to us in terms of capacity. I think both of those things were key, key factors. The uh, COINTELPRO, as well as us being uh, John Henry Clark, we call it tragically naive. I'm trying to think of a better word. I don't like that one. Uh, but we were certainly overwhelmed uh, with, the, with the response. I, I think that um, Fruz, I think John Henry Clark says, starving people eat junk food. Uh, better see yourself depicted. So, so we were depicting what struggle could be when we were giving people an opportunity to dream, to improve the quality of life. People were rushing to it. In the chapter I was in, there were maybe 20 official members of the Black Panther Party. But if we did something that called on the members of the Black Panther Party, there'd be another 150 people that showed up who were Black Panthers for that day or for that week, or for that month. Yeah, I, I don't know, do you want to speak to that? Um, no, yeah. there's over bigger questions, I mean, around movements in general, but I, I want to just maybe answer the question, yeah, I actually 
that, that's one of the things, just in general, from you know, orga the relationship between movements and organizations. Right? That's a big question, I think, that we see you know, uh, historically, and certainly I think it's one of the things that I would say the comparison, you know, my theme of like, you know, you know, do we do ourselves favors by always going back to the 60s as sort of the starting point of comparison? And sorry, sorry. Oh, sure. And you know, I think that um, you know, there's there's different uh, conditions for for organization and and for movement. But I always go back to Francis Fox Piven and Cloward's argument that you know, movements and organizations are not the same thing, and they do different things. And so you have moments of, of fast growth, you know, of, of of a movement where people are, you know. It's, so George's examples of almost you know, spontaneously or you know coming out in large numbers, and then you have periods where an organization that's sort of built upon that power that's, you know then survives more on a membership basis, um, and there's different sets of questions. So I would just say that those are the kinds of questions I think that um, you know that that, uh, that that all social movements have to deal with. You know, you have these moments, as, as you say, where like. The people are out, right? 1970 sounds like this case, but again, I think there's some, some forgotten instances in the last, you know, even 40 years in the Bay Area where this has happened. Where one day you're organizing, say, you know, campaign against apartheid, you get a certain number of people to your meeting, and next thing you know, you have an action. There's 5,000 people there, right? And you can do stuff for that, those people, right? Uh, but then, how do you sustain that? You know, what, what, how do you constitute success? What, and then, and then you have a different relationship with the state and law enforcement once they see that. Um, you can also, that's the moment too when leadership comes into play because some people are going to say, well, we got to you know, broker this. We've got to like, get some media demand, short term, legislative, you know, political. And then there's folks that are like, we have to you know, build to the next level. Right? Those are strategic questions. Um, but I do think that there's, you know, on this sort of uh, political economic basis, I think we look at different. Times comparing, say, say comparing the Black Panther or Black Lives Matter. I haven't read the book. It sounds incredible. It, it, it started in, say, with, with the AIDS crisis. But the political economy has changed, right? For in, in the United States, you know, anywhere in the world, and in particular, you know, there's uh, Robert D. G. Kelly. You know, talks about this a lot. You know, uh, what happens to you know, after the civil rights legislation? There's transformations of communities, right? And once you, you know, um, that whole story. You know, um, what what are the changes in labor force composition, right? That's a huge one, right? And so and, and social movements and organizations often tend to mirror the the other forms of organization. You know, so under you know, a century ago, you think of like Taylorism and Fordism and factory work, and you know the, the Vanguard Party of Lenin sort of being you know, kind of corresponds to this. And and so then you know now we have what's the model, the, the cutting edge of capitalist. Firms, you have logistical firms like Amazon, and you have these tech firms with office parks. So what would be? It's so, so longer, you know, 50 years ago, you might have said Detroit. You have these sort of huge factories, and you know that's a you know there's a relationship, right, to the form. You're not going to recognize the same organizational form in the struggle of the current moment that you would have seen 50 years ago. Um, people, this work for it, work days are organized differently, right? It's been noted. Um, uh, friend of mine made a film about the prisons, how Prisons in the 19, you know, mid 20th century model. I mean, schools model to look like factories. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. gave it away, right? Because it's like you have a little whistle come in, you know, Fordism, and then it's since the 70s, since neoliberalism and really the war on drugs and you know the the Clinton you know expansion of prisons, um, schools in inner cities start to look like prisons. The architecture, right? So those are sort of this these. These ways in which we have to look at our time, it, it shapes, it shapes everything, right? architecture, organizational forms. And so I think in that sense, it's unfair uh, to compare uh, movements of the present to the past uh, and, uh, because it's sometimes trying to shoehorn something in, but it's just not there. What is, you know, it just one last anecdote. I remember reading one of the books about um, the Black Panthers, how Huey Newton said, you know, he could, if he needed to work, he could just go down to the docks and get a job for a day, you know, okay. you know a well paid job. You know, that's not the case <laughs> for a very long time. In the same way that students, you know, in the 60s could uh, basically, if you were in, in, in UC, it was basically free, uh, and, you know, housing was very cheap, and you know, there were jobs at the end of the tunnel, and people had a lot more free time and less debt. And so those things, I think that that's very relevant when we make this comparison. Okay. Yeah, I just had a really quick thought to that also, which is uh, that. I was, I've been reading this book uh, um, that was put out about a decade after 
1968 May June events in, in Paris. And it's a, it's a very striking story because, of course, if we think about 9 to 10 million people being on a general strike for a period of weeks, there was only 48 million people mm. in France yeah. at the time. Yeah. So if we exclude children mm. and the elderly, mm. it's, you know, one in three working age adults, it was an extremely systemic uh, strike. And so I sort of uh, bantered a little bit with the issues about the wording of, you know, student riots, but of course these words are used in different ways. But it was this e extraordinary moment. And one of the things that was really striking to me as I was going through the book uh, is there's a page just beautifully written um, where you realize here they are three weeks into this strike. They actually, in retrospect, it certainly could have been, a, it seems like to me, a, a, you know, a successful, fulfilled, complete revolution. I mean, de Gaulle was mm -hmm. going to leave. I mean, he left the country for a little while, trying to, as people are wont to do in those situations. Like, what am I going to do? And he came back and said, no, I'm going to stay in power. But, you know, it would, maybe it would have been another week or two. I don't know. But then, but then what, right? Okay. And so there's this moment in the book, I'll just read you the line, where the organizers are talking, and um, he says, you know, what we, this is maybe three weeks into the strike, what we have done in France has reached the consciousness of the whole of Europe and will soon threaten the ruling classes of the whole world, from the bureaucrats in Moscow and Peking to the millionaires of Washington and Tokyo. Um, and he goes on, um, and then he says, um, the occupation of factories and public buildings throughout the country has not only halted the smooth running of the economy, but has above all brought about a general questioning of society. A deeply felt movement has been uh, made in nearly all sectors of the population to seek a change in their very way of life. From now on, it is a revolutionary mo movement lacking only a realization of what has already been done to really be master of this revolution. I mean, think. You know what would what would come next? You know, and that, so it goes back to um, the issue of occupying our imagination and freeing our imagination. It's not just sort of freeing the imagination in sort of creative cultural ways that we think about it in everyday sense, but the kind of detailed organization of a better society that could directly grapple with things like a rapid transition away from fossil fuels to something that people could look forward to. What book was that? Yeah, what was the name of that? It's, just, it's a, um, a, a, an anthology of original documents by, um, edited by Vladimir Fisera. So we had another question, and if there's others, feel free. Um, it's a beautiful question. It says, I agree that African women's voices are, quote, some of the most powerful on the planet, quote. How do you explain the causes of this strength? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know that they never not been strong. I, I think that they've certainly been more pronounced. Uh, that there's been uh, more leadership that's grown from uh, agitation than than ever before. Uh, the period after the end of the 1960s is a very difficult one for Africa because by the time you come to the 1970s uh, all these countries are just in tremendous uh, debt. Uh, it is a decade of debt, the 1970s and 1980s, and structural adjustment and uh, just about every aspect that uh, holds people to, uh, to part of the of a dream, a vision, is in, uh, in fairly wretched shape, meaning countries are paying uh, 35 to 40 percent of whatever they're earning uh, just on the interest uh, of, the, uh, of the debt. Um, that's, that's why I say it's, it's layered to talk about uh, Pan-Africanism, to make that horizontal connection between African-Americans and between the African continent. Um, in the Black Panther Party and other organizations are, are the, the way in which women were part of those particular movements. Uh, that's changed dramatically with what you see with Black Lives Matter. Uh, but in, in Africa, those voices have always uh, been there uh, in particular roles in the, in, the, in the market areas, in terms of um, you know, community organizations, in terms of uh, organizing. 
uh, you don't hear a lot about it, but uh, certainly in Mali and Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera, those movements during the period of Pan-Africanism, uh, during all of the liberation movements, whether it was SWAPO or MPLA, all of those had cadres, uh, which were women who were involved in the political thought, etc. Uh, certainly during the, uh, I think one of the things that happened particularly in South Africa was that uh, most of, and I think I don't want to be unfair here with the African National Congress, the African National Congress gets a tremendous amount of credit, but uh, certainly after 1960 and the Rivonia trial, most of the leadership of the African National Congress uh, is incarcerated. And you begin a period by the late 1960s and early 1970s uh, where you have the black consciousness movement. And many of the organizations that you see between the time that Nelson Mandela was released in 1980 uh, basically are community organizations, they're civic organizations, and women's voices and youth voices and workers' voices are very, very strong there. So it wasn't that the voices wasn't, uh, weren't there. It's just that from my radio experience, I was speaking that uh, the people I interview, um, the people who lead organizations, who lead African Rising, um, those are new voices, those are louder voices in this period of history. I don't have an exact reason as to why at this moment more than any other moment, but those are some of my thoughts. And here too in the United States, if you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, that's been a major, uh, a major, a major difference. And if you if you drill into some of the things that happened in in, in Ferguson, the pushback on movements simply being led by uh, by men is a big piece. If you look at the period in Ferguson where you have some of the elder leaders like Jesse Jackson and other people that come in, and I think one woman says in there, she says, uh, being young is a phase, it's not necessarily an age. And people like Angela Davis and that, they be certainly become more, uh, more prominent, but particularly uh, feminist voices, queer voices, uh, they're very, very active in this, uh, in this period of, uh, of Ferguson. And, and some of it has been that there's been more intention, whether you're talking about the case of uh, Sandra Bland, whether you're talking about the case of the uh, woman who was uh, killed in her own home, uh, Keisha, I believe was her first name. Uh, the movement of Say Her Name uh, was very much a part of that. I mean, these are forerunners of, I think, what we see in terms of Me Too and many of the other things. This is where some of these voices are, uh, are coming from. And, and I, I think the other part of it, too, that, that ties along with what Stokely Carmichael and Kwame Kuturi was doing was that you have voices now where people are saying they're unapologetically black, that they have moved away from this notions of the politics of respectability. And so you see that in Ferguson, that there are no politics of respectability, that you do what you have to to be able to move forward. And particularly, uh, if you go around the country, 100 million uh, hoodies for justice, a blackout collective, uh, the women who locked off the uh, Golden Gate, the Oakland Bay Bridge, many of these organizations are, are led by women. And then the support organizations that have allowed people to not be burned out, uh, meaning um, the Blackout Collective and others who actually do training around trauma and grief, etc. These are the big, big voices uh, over the last five or six years in the African American uh, community. I sort of wonder if any of the audience has answered that one. I think it's a really important question because just in noticing over the last 10 years of so many social movements, the role of women with um, Black Lives Matter, of course, was founded by, you know, three women, um, many women leaders in the movement. I Will Know More has an extraordinary range of, of women who began it, who led it, and, and it's, of course, one of the more or the general Native American uprising throughout the North America in recent years has been one of the most powerful, uh, you know, consequential social movements as well. Me Too, of course. And so, um, I don't know if anyone saw the, the keynote by Jacinda Arden at the United Nations, but it's a little bit of a counterpoint to Trump's speech. Well, is there a question? Yeah, maybe Rick, come up to the mic, or we can bring it to you. Oh, sure. I, this is a, actually a question about your presentation, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I I heard you, um, you know, you know, art, articulating that that growth growth economics is not compatible with um, you know with the planet. 
period and that these you know large entities or corporations need to um, you know take take lead in in, in this um, and I'm, I'm just wondering how far your own position goes toward you know full-on anti-capitalism I mean this is a I mean I, I, I'm not sure what worlds what all the worlds are that you travel in, or, and, and how, or how you try to frame your discourse for different audiences, but um, you know, at least for me, um, you know, the, I think one of the most important developments in the last five or ten years, at least, is you know a resurgence of the anti-capitalist uh, front, uh, which for me. Uh, was arguably the most important unifying factor in in post you know 1960s you know an anti imperialist often often black led uh, but anti imperialist uh, uh, anti capitalist project um, and I'm just wondering I'm wondering if you you know uh, have a have a theory if you have, what your theoretical position is um, about capitalism you know from from a, I'm asking this question from a sort of Marxist perspective. You know, do you you take you take the idea that um, you know capitalism has to be superseded seriously, or do you think there's some reformist compromise position with yeah, what yeah. they were? Well, uh, it's a great question, and I would love to hear the whole panel's answer to this one because it's so central. Uh, obviously, it's been such a you know, part of the legacy of McCarthyism and COINTELPRO and every, all the other counter movements has been to create this incredible taboo where the rest of the, much of the rest of the industrialized world talks about it. Sometimes clearer terms. It's starting to change a lot, right, with the rise of, for example, Democratic Socialists of America, bringing fresh discourse um, in the new generational point of view. And I think I take Kenneth Boulding's statement incredibly seriously it, you know anyone who's looked at climate science it, even if you're not a marxist which i guess i am you know any if you look at the climate science of the last 20 years um we are hurtling past these major thresholds and many i could just rattle them off from the last 10 years and so if you if you don't see a, a contradiction between growth and the integrity of the life systems of our biosphere you're probably, I think you're missing the big story of our generation, of our, of our world right now. Um, there, there's, I, I don't, there's nothing in dispute anymore. You know, there's nothing speculative about climate science. And if, if we're going to be clear about the drivers of it, and obviously it's fossil fuel, and obviously it's the entire ideological and material system that supports um, using them so flagrantly. I think the example of the oil flaring in Nigeria the gas flaring in the Niger Delta is a good one, if, you know, for, for green growth, you know, boosters. To really look at that, what's the logic behind gas flaring causing more greenhouse gas emissions than all of Sub-Saharan Africa together? That's a short answer, I think. would love to give a much longer one, but I think maybe my co-panelists could do an even much better job. I just have one, you know, it's up to you, I mean, Clearly, I think the more people are talking about, about capitalism, and not euphemistically anymore, more directly, and that involves being precise in definition. But um, what's interesting to me is, you know, I think capitalism itself has changed. Uh, capitalism has changed, we talk about neoliberalism. And you talk, you know, just make, make something about utopias. I think utopia, dystopia are kind of in a, in a dialectic. One of the interesting things about, you know, the 60s in the rich world, something called the overdeveloped world, whatever the first world, uh, was that it was noted that the the subjects of history were not the usual, were not the usual suspects, right? It's, it was often expected that it's whether the wretched of the earth or the proletariat are going to be, you know, leading the struggle, and uh, it, it looked at least superficially that it was you know, it was it was um, students and people in the affluent parts of the world that were, you know. Some of the most militant, not, not, all, not always, obviously in conjunction with um, you know, anti-colonial struggles, including the internal colonies, you know, in, in the U.S. And, and so here we have one of the contradictions of capitalism, which is in its in its peak in the 1960s, the post-war peak in the U.S., which we now know is, you know, obviously besides being predicated on the unpaid labor of women, colonies, and nature, you know, it's also in that sort of window before 
time the crisis was apparent, that there was a huge rejection of capitalism, not only for its obvious failings, such as inequality and poverty, but also for its supposed successes, i.e., you know, the affluent society, you know, the good society. And I think this takes us into, you know, counterculture and some of the other responses, right? So you do have this this moment where people, even you know, Murray Butchin talking about post scarcity advocacy, this idea that you know that this affluence was a, was a, a permanent thing that was going to be spread around the world. And some of the slides that George showed today, the situationist inspired critique, we you know talking about boredom was basically saying, you know, it's not that we're, we want bread, or that you know, we're, we're working terrible hours, although that may have been the case, but also that we don't want what's being offered. Right? We don't want this good life that's on offer. Um, so that to me is sort of the, so the, this, the utopia of capitalism in a way, this thing that you know, American um, leaders, industrial leaders, were sort of you know, throwing a cruise shop and saying, oh, here in the US we have more stuff, our workers can get more stuff. That was being rejected you know, on its own terms. And, um, I think that's something that, again, is, is a difference between the moment now. I think we're back now to those other forms of contradiction. And David Harvey, one of our you know, leading scholars of capitalism, has a recent book, I think one of his best, called 17 Contradictions of Capitalism. <laughs> okay? you know, and, well, I studied with uh, James O'Connor, who just passed away um, last year, a brilliant uh, economist, uh, who uh, he, he, he came up with the idea of the second contradiction. So I think you can keep it more simple, maybe not 17, but I think it's, it's, it's worth reading. But I mean, the first being the classic, you know, the realization crisis, right? That you know, capitalism, you know, uh, does not it, it, you know, the exploitation of workers causes a demand side crisis. Uh, that you know, this, it, it produces so much, but how are you going to make profit in doing so? I mean, there's various versions of this. But the second contradiction um, has to do with these conditions of production, including the environment. But now other scholars would say, well, this includes all these sort of preconditions for capitalism. You know, Social reproduction, you know, the gender dynamics. I mean, the unpaid labor again. We mentioned forms of labor that aren't wage labor, and of course, um, extractivism and extraction of resources from colonies. Those things are coming back, you know, as this kind of haunting specter of this within, the, very clearly within the system. So I think it's an interesting moment that that the, the contradictions, the reason anti-capitalism is making a comeback, may be different from the 1960s rebellions. Uh, uh, we don't. We've been. So, but Jenny mentioning, you know, that the, Malth the neo Malthusians, right, the population bomb, the limits to growth, because this sort of this is kind of response to some sectors of elites capital after these, these rebellions of the '60s, which include these countercultural expressions, so people dropping out, withdrawing from, you know, as much as possible from the society. Then you start having this austerity really coming down hard, right? So once we establish again scarcity. As Carson Malthus proposed 200 years ago, why should there not be welfare? Why should, you know, the poor houses in Britain, you know, where these Irish migrants have been displaced in their lands, were coming in huge numbers? He was basically saying to other members of the elite, let them starve, right? Feeding them only encourages them. He's very upfront about it you know, when you read Malthus, which is why it's so shocking that early in these people are basically saying Malthus was right. So look at what he said. And he was basically, it was, it was not a, a discourse on poverty, uh, on population rather, it was a discourse on poverty. And it was saying you know, the poor are to blame for their own poverty, they agree too much, they're morally failing. But most importantly, he was asserting that contrary to what's before your very eyes, that the reason for suffering has to do with absolute scarcity. And, um, and this is, you know, this was something that in the 1960s was quite clear to uh, those who were privileged enough to be in the United States the rich parts of the world, it's like, no, there's not scarcity. What's going on here is political. Why is it that people are unhappy even if they have wealth, and why is it that so many people don't have basic necessities? Um, but I do think that, you know, subsequently, you know, um, we've had this austerity, we call it neoliberalism, especially hits, you know, the African continent, uh, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, the IMF just hammers these regions, right, uh, with, with structural adjustment programs, which basically, uh, forced nations to, to slash whatever programs, education, anything that they had. Um, and we've actually seen an immiseration of the global south in recent decades, which um, I think has, is, you know, is the root of many of the crises. Uh, uh, and it's not resolved. But I think now that austerity is also starting to reach into the global north. You know, in the EU, it's starting to increase. And of course, in the United States, you know, uh, I think it's, it's quite clear <laughs> by now, and I used to remember Reagan era, people said, this is what's going to happen in 30 years if this guy's elected with this, and here we are. Um, 
So I don't know if that's I'm going to pass it to <laughs> Morgan, but thank you. I think this is the, the crucial question. But I think you know what are the contradictions that are the most politically salient in terms of mobilizing resistance and forming new kinds of, of solidarities, uh, you know, uh, expansive and, and you know identities you know, and imaginations around uh, a way out of it. Well, could you want to add anything? Question in the back? Yeah, unless there is more to add. Can you come up? Sure. I was just wondering, is there more to that you'd like to add? Could you, could you speak in the mic? Yeah. Should I ask a new question, or do you want to continue with this one? Uh, you can ask a new question, unless, I mean, I think, yeah. Um, OK, I have to confess, I'm a bit on the shaky ground here, because I <laughs> don't feel so connected to the movement as some of these very distinguished guests here are. But my question is this, why did the 1968 revolution fall short of a political change? Was it a failure of imagination or is it because that the revolutionary spirit does not lend itself to stable governance? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say, and I think the two of you probably have excellent answers, the first thing is that there was political change. There's a lot of political change, and there's been um, echoes and ripples uh, of that ever since. And, and as uh, I think, as you know, in the first talk, as Eddie showed, there's um, all of these uprisings, all of these movements influence each other, both contemporaneously and over history. Um, and um, as uh, George mentioned in his keynote this morning, even let's say just the example of the um, May-June uprisings in France, even though we might say, oh, what if, you know, what if they had gone for even more uh, societal organization, they could have prefigured what we needed to not get into the Anthropocene to begin with, etc. But they did get 35% pay raises, and um, they got a much lower retirement age, they got a lot of very clear material benefits. So that's just one example. But, uh, no, sorry, I'd like to just press this further. I mean, the closest, it, what I understand was that God's government almost fell. I'm talking about, why didn't it lead to... Revolution in France? Or? Yeah, like a new government. Or a, and is it because we don't have anything better than capitalism and democracy? That's the question I'm asking. It's such an important, it's such a huge, incredible question. Thank you so much. I think I'll turn it to Walter. I wasn't clear on the question. The question was, why did we pick... Uh, if you want to just restate it one time with the mic, it's, it's such a, a great question. I'm sorry, I don't want to try to... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just said I, I it. Um, okay, let me go back. Um, 1968 was already, like the State Revolution, was already against capitalism. And 50 years later, what do we see? We see actually capitalism joining forces with democrat democracy and basically it's corporate culture that rules of government, it rules economy, it rules society. So my question is, I mean, it was such an amazing global phenomenon, the 1968 revolution. Why could we bring about political changes and changing, finding new forms of governance? Or, uh, but okay, let me ask a, another way to look at the question is, what would you say after 50 years, were the shortcomings of the 19th century revolution? Where did we, what could we done more? What were the shortcomings of the of the period of 1968? Why why, is it, why wasn't it more, why weren't the changes more dramatic? Yeah, and more lasting. And more sustainable. And more, more lasting. lasting. Yeah. More sustainable. Sustainable, yeah. Well, I, I can speak to it two ways. I mean, from the from the area I was speaking about very uh, specifically. Um, in, in part, I mean, when you when you take a look specifically at the African at the African continent, I, I did a look on it before a couple of days ago, meaning that the African countries are the, the last bulk of countries to receive, quote unquote, even flag independence. Meaning, if you look from 1960 on, that more countries on the African continent received 
what I call flag independence, than any other place in the world. Meaning that in 1950, before 1957, it's Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, and Libya. In 1957, it's Ghana. In 1958, it's Guinea. And in 19, uh, and two countries uh, were countries that were not colonized, i.e. Liberia and Ethiopia. So out of the current 53 countries who were carved out of the Berlin Conference, which mistakenly sometimes is looked at as the division of Africa, but it was more like a contract for the European powers, except for Portugal, who was already there, to go in to kind of uh, establish themselves. In 1960, which is considered to be the year of Africa, there are 17 countries that receive independence. But by the end of the 1960s, 25 coups or, or self-coups have occurred. So when I teach a course in ancient African history and a course in contemporary African politics, I always say to students that Africa is a relatively young continent. And that's very, very true. Um, it doesn't necessarily, and so for the African countries, that period from the post-World War II on, what some people refer to as the Cold War, was a hot war for Africa. So whether you're looking at what happened in Angola, whether you're looking at Mozambique, uh, et cetera, these were vicious, vicious uh, um, wars. So it was very difficult. And then debt was foisted upon these, these countries. If you look, for example, at the French countries, the French and West African countries still offer under what we call the SAFA, meaning the percentage of their money goes to France, France gets first right, to any minerals that came from them. So that was that, was that particular piece of it. In regards to African Americans, I don't think I said it earlier because I'm still thinking through it, and I didn't want to sound too, too brash and too arrogant here. Um, but um, there's this incident where uh, 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 Malcolm X is, uh, I believe, on a plane and he's having a conversation. And at some point, the, the person he's talking with next to him falls asleep, et cetera, et cetera. And she wakes up, or he wakes up, and he looks at his suitcase and he says, Oh, you're Malcolm X. And, you know, they said, Well, you know, I had expected somebody who was out to kill all white people. And Malcolm X responds, just kind of like, as if all white people could be killed. And the conversation goes on, and uh, her point is, well, you know, things aren't like they were in the good old days. And Malcolm's exit thing is like, the good old days for who? Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and I say that to my students even when we're talking about the 1960s. I was, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, and I, I remember the period of the Panhandle and Haight Ashbury and a number of other things. But 1965, and the Grateful Dead, and Creedence, and Killawar, and Byron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was the same year that in Birmingham and other places people were being attacked with dogs. So this notion of very, is, is, memory is very, very important. Um, African Americans uh, have a, uh, the notion of slavery and bondage being developed as a race-based institution has been so intimately connected. African Americans have been enslaved, quote unquote, longer than they actually had a mandate for freedom in the United States. And so the struggle of African Americans, particularly in terms of, uh, of what, how to define freedom, how to define change, uh, has been a very, very difficult one. Um, Two, two, things that one, two things that happened, which I, I, I didn't uh, mention earlier, uh, one was certainly closed from um, uh, COINTELPRO, but in the 1960s, for example, in terms of the goals and aims of African Americans, all the key African American leaders are assassinated. They're all assassinated. Malcolm X in 1965, Martin Luther King in 1968, after his speech of war in Vietnam, Medgar Evers, they're all assassinated. The other turning point um, are the events that occur in 1971, and that are the events which are still with us today, which are the events that occurred in Attica. I mean, it became clear in 
that the, the road to blunting the continued organization of the African American community, uh, the continued ability to dream, to imagine, was going to be part of what the criminal justice system was going to attack. And the numbers of African American men, and increasingly over the last decade, African American women and Latino women who find themselves incarcerated has just been off the hook. So those are, those are two key issues in terms of this discussion about Pan-Africanism or these, these connections. And, and, I, and I, 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 around the issue of Pan-Africanism, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot of room for rethink. Because the period before 1945, African-Americans, I'm talking in the black world at this point, African-Americans kind of held the cards to some degree about what Pan-Africanism was before we get up to the period of, of the 1960. But we've always been missing a piece, and that was a piece about the being inclusive about those people who were African who were part of the diaspora. So that Pan-Africanism has not until very, very recently began to say, we're looking at Colombia, we're looking at Brazil, we're looking at Haiti, we're looking at Cuba. In fact, when you hear African Americans coming back from Cuba, their notion is, and it's always an interesting one, because I've been to Cuba around 80 or 90 times, the African American notion is when we go to Cuba, they're still racist. You know, um, bingo. Uh, you know, but let's, let's be real here with, with what's going on. So I, I think that that was, that, was, that was part of it. Maybe some of what uh, Eddie was talking about in terms of the difference between movements and between uh, organizations, but a tremendous degree of, of repression was brought down on the African-American communities in trying to build that particular uh, vision. Those leaders who came to power, whether it was Museveni uh, in Uganda, whether it was Mobutu, Mobutu was in power in the Congo, one of the wealthiest pieces of Africa, from 1965 until 1997. Um, and see, Eddie mentioned some of the things we don't know, being that on the same year that Nelson Mandela becomes elected, it's the same year that the Rwandan genocide occurred. And this, this notion that we have of Southern Africa as a block, because those of us who were in the anti-apartheid movement, we talked about Southern Africa, we talked about Zimbabwe, and Mozambique, and all these pieces would be fit together. That's no longer the case. That's no longer the case. If you look at what's happened in Mozambique, if you look what's happened in South Africa, if you look what's happened in Namibia, et cetera, there's no longer any block here. Um, these leaders, in many cases, have been uh, corrupted or abused or uh, have received monies in terms of what we call onerous debt to be able to manage those. So th that's at least a perspective from the work that I, uh, that I do. But it, it hasn't been uh, lost. Whenever I'm traveling, wherever I am, the, the most asked question is about the legacy of the Black Panther Party, the legacy of the Black Movement. And I, I think that you certainly see some of that now, what you see in Black Lives Matter. I think some of you see that on the on the African continent. There is a tremendous, not to be believed, movement of voices on the African continent, of young people. Africa is principally young people at this point. Mm -hmm. And me, you name the area, and there are people who are involved. So that's the positive side. I know I talked too long, but thank you. No, and that's really hard to follow up. I mean, I, I just. I just want to say, uh, to your question, I think there's three words, you know, uh, revolution, capitalism, democracy, all of which have to be, you know, defined. Because I, I think that people use these words with thinking of different things. And hmm. so starting with, I mean, capitalism, it's not a, a capitalist country, this or that. It's a, it's a world system. It's a capitalist system. So a revolution of one country, Cuba, wherever, you know, or one region, Rojava, Chiapas, you know, that's... Then people say, well, what have you done? You've got shortages. Well, it's a capitalist world system. You know, we're one country. We had a monograph or whatever, so it's difficult. Uh, democracy is not a, I mean, this way, I think democracy is not a, a kind of form of government. It's a process which can take place in this room or, you know, family or, you know, at a transnational level or, you know, any level. And that, I think, is one of the legacies, uh, the enduring legacies of the, of the 60s is taking democracy seriously again. And then finally, I mean, revolution, uh, you know, again, I think the rest of this conference will be dealing with the revolution in other dimensions that I, we haven't even talked about today, around consciousness and around, you know, living in all sorts of ways. But I also want to mention, you know, the, the dialectic, sort of what Walter was referring to, is you have revolutionary movement, you have counter-revolution. And, and counter-revolutions historically often last longer than revolutions. 
you know. Yeah, but we're, you know, people are still being punished. Haiti is still being punished for being the first successful slave revolution. You know, as something that shook the world system to the foundations and will never be forgiven. Uh, Two hundred years, and this is the case. You know, Vietnam was, you know, the U.S. wouldn't pay the reparations it promised. You know, you can go down the list, but I think at the cultural level. So I'm thinking about just to conclude that you know, I started off with about the different legacies of the '60s. You know that, that, that work against the president, and of course, the, the, the one version is the right wing version, right? Which is the, always the right wing in America and elsewhere as well. But such so saying here, it will always be at war with the '60s, right? Mm -hmm. was whatever their idea of it is, that the era when everything went wrong, when when uh, you know women got out of the kitchen and blacks went out of the back of the bus and gays got out of the closet and children were heard and seen and not heard and everybody, you know, Asians were invisible and all of a sudden all these voices emerged and started raising hell and there's this nostalgia, which obviously Trump, but you know, saw this with Reagan, it is endless. You know, this is 50 years later, who's fighting the war against the 60s? It's that long counter revolution. But that shows that there was something that was done right also. Um, <laughs> and also, you know, they're, they're kind of running out of steam on that one as well. So, it's, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I think we, are, you know, we need to really exercise our uh, imagination and our critical thinking uh, in, a, in an extreme way. And, and part of that is taking words like this and really exploring them more. I love the work of, say, Nancy Fraser and Vijay Prashad and others on the nature of capitalism. It's not an economic system, as he says, a world system, but if you think about any aspect of our life, um, housing, rent, employment, family, uh, so many things, they're all wrapped up in the structures, organization, and processes of um, you know, capitalism, democracy or lack thereof, <laughs> etc. And so it's incumbent upon all of us to uh, bring back that part of the 60s, which is that deeper thinking about a much better society, because obviously it's only that much more um, significant. I think we're at the end of our time, but thank you everybody so much for thank you.